Chapter 2 Socialism World Road to Power for the Super Rich Everyone knows that Adolf Hitler existed. No one disputes that. The terror and destruction that this madman inflicted upon the world are universally recognized. Hitler came from a poor family which had absolutely no social position. He was a high school dropout and nobody ever accused him of being cultured. Yet this man tried to conquer the world. During his early career, he sat in a cold garret and poured onto paper his ambitions to rule the world. We know that. Similarly, we know that a man named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin also existed. Like Hitler, Lenin did not spring from a family of social lions, the son of a petty bureaucrat. Lenin, who spent most of his adult life in poverty, has be been responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of your fellow human beings and the enslavement of nearly a billion more. Like Hitler, Lenin sat up nights in a dank garret scheming how he could conquer the world. We know that too. Is it not theoretically possible that a billionaire could be sitting not in a garret but in a penthouse in Manhattan, London, or Paris and dream the same dream as Lenin and Hitler? You'll have to admit it is theoretically possible. Julius Caesar, a wealthy aristocrat, did, and such a man might form an alliance or association with other like-minded men, might he not? Caesar did. These men would be superbly educated, command immense social prestige, and be able to pull astonishing amounts of money to carry out their purposes. These are advantages that Hitler and Lenin did not have. It is difficult for the average individual to fathom such perverted lust for power. The typical person, of whatever nationality, wants only to enjoy success in his job, to be able to afford a reasonably high standard of living, complete with leisure and travel, he wants to provide for his family in sickness and in health, and to give his children a sound education. His ambition stops there. He has no desire to exercise power over others, to conquer other lands or peoples, to be a king. He wants to mind his own business and enjoy life. Since he has no lust for power, it is difficult for him to imagine that there are others who have, others who march to a far different drum. But we must realize that there have been Hitlers and Lenins and Stalins and Caesars and Alexander the Greats throughout history. Why should we assume there are no such men today with perverted lust for power? If these men happen to be billionaires, is it not possible that they would use men like Hitler and Lenin as pawns to seize power for themselves? Indeed, difficult as this is to believe, such is the case. Like Columbus, we are faced with the task of convincing you that the world is not flat, as you have been led to believe all your life, but instead is round. We are going to present evidence that what you call communism is not run from Moscow or Peking, but is an arm of a bigger conspiracy, run from New York, London, and Paris. The men at the epoch of this movement are not communists in the traditional sense of that term. They feel no loyalty to Moscow or Peking. They are loyal only to themselves and their undertaking. And these men certainly do not believe in the claptrap pseudo-philosophy of communism. They have no intention of dividing their wealth. Socialism is a philosophy which conspirators exploit, but in which only the naive believe. Just how finance capitalism is used as the anvil and communism as the hammer to conquer the world will be explained in this book. The concept that communism is but an arm of a larger conspiracy has become increasingly apparent throughout the author's journalistic investigations. He has had the opportunity to interview privately four retired officers who spent their careers high in military intelligence. Much of what the author knows he learned from them, and the story is known to several thousand others. High military intelligence circles are well aware of this network. In addition, the author has interviewed six men who have spent considerable time as investigators for congressional committees. In 1953, one of these men, Norman Dodd, headed the Reese Committee's investigation of tax-free foundations. When Mr. Dodd began delving into the role of international high finance in the World Revolutionary Movement, the investigation was killed on orders from the Eisenhower-occupied White House. According to Mr. Dodd, it is permissible to investigate the radical bomb throwers in the streets, but when he began to trace their activities back to their origins in the legi legitimate world, the polit political iron curtain slams down. You can believe anything you want about communism except that it is a conspiracy run by men from the respectable world. People will often say to an active anti-communist, I can understand your concern with communism, but the idea that a communist conspiracy is making great inroads in the United States is absurd. The P American people are anti-communists. They are not about to buy communism. 
it's understandable to be concerned about communism in Africa or Asia or South America with their tremendous poverty, ignorance, and disease, but to be concerned about communism in the United States when the vast majority of people have no sympathy with it whatsoever is a misspent concern. On the face of it, that is a very logical and plausible argument. The American people are indeed anti-communists. Suppose you were to lay this book down right now, pick up a clipboard, and head for the nearest shopping center to conduct a survey on Americans' attitudes about communism. Sir, you say to the first prospect you encounter, we would like to know if you are for or against communism. Most people would probably think you were putting them on. If we stick to our survey, we would find that 99% of the people are anti-communists. We probably would be hard to find, hard put to find anybody who would take an affirmative stand for communism. So on the surface, it appears that the charges made against anti-communists concerned with the internal threat of communism are valid. The American people are not pro-communists, but before our imaginary interview, he walks away in disgust with what he believes is a hockey survey. You add, Sir, before you leave, there are a couple of other questions I would like to ask. You won't find these quite so insulting or ludicrous. Your next question is, what is communism? Will you define it, please? Immediately, a whole new situation is developed. Rather than the near unanimity previously found, we now have an incredible diversity of ideas. There are a multitude of opinions on what communism is. Some will say, oh yes, communism. Well, that's a tyrannical brand of socialism. Others will maintain, communism as it was originally intended by Karl Marx was a good idea. It has never been practiced, and the Russians have loused it up. A more eroded diet type might proclaim, communism is simply a rebirth of Russian imperialism. If perchance one of the men you asked to define communism happened to be a political science professor from the local college, he might well reply, you can't ask what is communism. That is a totally simplistic question with an extremely complex situation. Communism today, quite unlike the view held by the right-wing extremists in America, is not an international monolithic movement. Rather, it is a polycentric, fragmented, nationalistic movement driving its character through the charismas of its various national leaders. Well, of course, there is the welding of Hegelian dialectics with Feuerbachian materialism held in common by the communist parties generally. It is a movement oversimplification, monumental oversimplification, to ask what is communism. Instead, you should ask, what is the communism of Mao Zedong? What is the communism of the late Ho Chi Minh, or Fidel Castro, or Marshal Tito? If you think we are being f fascists here, you have talked to a political science professor lately. For the above is the prevailing view on our campuses, not to mention in our State Department. Whether you agree or disagree with any of these definitions, or, uh, or as may well be the case, you have one of your own. One thing is undeniable. No appreciable segment of the anti-communist American public can agree on just what it is that they are against. Isn't that frightening? Here we have something that almost everybody agrees is bad, but we cannot agree on just what it is we are against. How would this work in a football game, for example? Can you imagine how effective the defense of a football team would be if the front and four could not agree with the linebackers who could not agree with the corner backs who could not agree with the safety men who could not agree with the assistant coaches who could not agree with the head coach as to what kind of defense they should put up against the offense being presented. The obvious result would be chaos. You could take a Sandlot team and successfully pit them against the Green Bay Packers if the Packers couldn't agree on what it is they are opposing. This is academic. The first principle in an encounter, whether it be football or war, hot or cold, is know your enemy. The American people do not know their enemy. Consequently, it is not strange at all that for three decades we have been watching one country of the world after another fall behind the communist curtain. In keeping with the fact that almost everybody seems to have his own definition of communism, we are going to give you ours, and then we will attempt to pr prove to you that it is the only valid one. Communism. An international conspiratorial drive for power on the part of men in high places, willing to use any means to bring about their desired aim, global conquest. You will notice that we did not mention Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, bourgeoisie, proletariat, or dialectical materialism. We said nothing of the pseudo-economics or political philosophy of the communists. 
These are the techniques of communism and should not be confused with the communist conspiracy itself. We did call it an international conspiratorial driver power. Unless we understand the conspiratorial nature of communism, we don't understand it at all. We will be eternally fixated on the Gus Hall level of communism. And that's not where it's at, baby. The way to bring about the wrath of the liberal press establishment or the professor of liberals is simply to use the word conspiracy in relation to communism. We're not supposed to believe that communism is a political conspiracy. We can't believe anything else we wish to about it. We can't believe that it is brutal, tyrannical, evil, or even in that intends to bury us. And we will win the plaudits of the vast majority of American people. But don't ever, ever use the word conspiracy if you expect applause. That is when the wrath of liberaldom will be unleashed against you. We are not allowed... We are not disallowed from believing in all types of conspiracy, just modern political conspiracy. We know that down through the annals of history, small groups of men have existed who have conspired to bring the reins of power into their hands. History books are full of their schemes. Even Life magazine believes in conspiracies like the Cosa Nostra, which, where men conspired to make money through crime. You may recall that Life did a series of articles on the testimony of Joseph Valici, before the McClellan Committee several years ago, there are some aspects of those revelations which are worth noting. Most of us did not know the organization was called Cosa Nostra until Vellici sang. We all thought it was named the Mafia. That is how little we know about this group, despite the fact that it was a century old and had been operating in many countries with a self-perpetuating clique of leaders. We didn't even know it by its proper name. It is not possible a political conspiracy might exist. Waiting for a Joseph Litchi to testify? Is Dr. Carroll Quigley the Joseph Litchi of political conspiracies? We see that everybody, even Life Magazine, believes in some sort of conspiracy. The question is, which is the more lethal form of conspiracy, criminal, or political? And what is the difference between a member of the Cosa Nostra and a communist? or more properly, an insider conspirator. Men like Lucky Luciano, who have scratched and clawed to the top of the heap in organized crime, must of necessity be diabolic diabolically brilliant, cunning and absolutely ruthless. But almost without exception, the men in the hierarchy of organized crime have had no formal education. They were born into poverty and leaned their trade in the ba back alleys of Naples, New York, or Chicago. Now suppose someone with the same immoral grasping personality were born into a patrician family of great wealth and was educated at the best prep schools then Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, followed by graduate work possibly at Oxford. In these institutions, he would become totally familiar with history, economics, psychology, sociology, and political science. After having graduated from such illustrious establishments of higher learning, are we likely to find him out on the streets peddling 50-cent tickets to a numbers game? Would you find him pushing marijuana to high schoolers or running a string of houses of prostitution? Would he be getting involved in gangland killings? Not at all. But with that sort of education, this person would realize that one wants power, power, real power. The lessons of history say, get into the government business. Become a politician and work for political power, or better yet, get some politicians to front for you. That is where the real power and the real money is. Conspiracy to seize the power of government is as old as government itself. You can't study the conspiracies surrounding Alcibiades in Greece or Julius Caesar in ancient Rome, but we are not supposed to think that men today scheme to achieve political power. Every conspirator has two things in common with every other conspirator. He must be an accomplished liar and a far-seeing planner. Whether you are studying Hitler, Alcibiades, Julius Caesar, or some of our contemporary conspirators, we'll find that their patient planning is almost overwhelming. We repeat FDR's said statement in politics. Nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. In reality, communism is a tyranny planned by power seekers whose most effective weapon is the big lie. And if one takes all the lies of communism and boils them down, you will find they distill into two major lies, out of which all others spring. They are, one, communism is inevitable, 
and two, communism is a movement of the downtrodden masses rising up against exploiting bosses. Let's go back to our imaginary survey and analyze our, our first big lie of communism, that it is inevitable. Do we recall that we asked our interviewee if he was for or against communism, then we asked him to define it. Now we are going to ask him, Sir, do you think communism is inevitable in America? And in almost every case, the response will be something like this. Oh, well, no, I don't think so. You know how Americans are. We are a little slow sometimes in reacting to danger. You remember Pearl Harbor, but the American people would never sit still for communism. Next, we ask him, Well then, do you think socialism is inevitable in America? The answer in almost every case will be similar to this. I'm no socialist, you understand, but I see what is going on in this country. Yeah, I'd have to say that socialism is inevitable. Then we ask our interviewee, Since you say you are not a socialist, but you feel the country is being socialized, why don't you do something about it? His response will run, I'm only one person. Besides, it's inevitable. You can't fight City Hall. Heh heh heh. Don't you know that the boys down at City Hall are doing everything they can to convince you of that? How effectively can you oppose anything if you feel your opposition is futile? Giving your opponent the idea that defending himself is futile is as old as warfare itself. In about 500 BC, the Chinese warlord philosopher Sun Tzu stated, Supreme excellence in warfare lies in the destruction of your enemy's will to resist in advance of perceptible hostilities. We call it Psy War, or Psychological Warfare today. In poker, it is called running a good bluff. The principle is the same. Thus we have the American people, anti-communist but unable to define it, and anti-socialist but thinking it is inevitable. How did Marx view communism? How important is the inevitability of communism to the communists? What do the communists want you to believe is inevitable, communism or socialism? If you study Marx's Communist Manifesto, you'll find that in essence Marx said the proletarian revolution would establish the socialist dictatorship of the proletariat. To achieve the socialist dictatorship of the, pro the proletariat, three things would have to be accomplished. 1. The elimination of all right to private property. 2. The dissolution of the family unit. And 3. Destruction of what Marx referred to as the opiate of the mass of the people, religion. Marx went on to state that when the dictatorship of the proletariat had accomplished these three things throughout the world, and after some undetermined length of time, as you can imagine, he was very vague in, that, in this point, the all-powerful state would miraculously wither away and state socialism would give way to communism. You wouldn't need any government at all. Everything would be peace, sweetness, and light, and everybody would live happily ever after. But first, all communists mo must work to establish socialism. Can't you just see Karl Marx really believing that an omnipotent state would wither away? Or can you imagine that a Joseph Stalin or any other man with the cunning and ruthlessness necessary to rise to the top of the heap in an all-powerful dictatorship would voluntarily dismantle the power he had built by fear and terror? Footnote. Karl Marx was hired by a mysterious group who called themselves the League of Just Men to write the Communist Manifesto as demagogic boob bait to appeal to the mob. In fact, in actual fact, the Communist Manifesto was in circulation for many years before Marx's name was widely enough recognized to establish his authorship for this revolutionary handbook. All Karl Marx really did was to update and codify the very same revolutionary plans and principles set down 70 years earlier by Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Order of Illuminati in Bavaria, and it is widely acknowledged by serious scholars of the subject that the League of Just Men was simply an extension of the Illuminati, which was forced to go deep underground after it was exposed by a raid in 1786 conducted by the Bavarian authorities. Socialism would be the bait, the excuse to establish the dictatorship. Since dictatorship is hard to sell in idealistic terms, the idea had to be added that the dictatorship was just a temporary necessity and would soon dissolve of its own accord. You really have to be naive to swallow that, but millions do. The drive to establish socialism, not communism, is the epic core of everything the communists and the insiders do. Marx and all of his successors in the communist movement have ordered their followers to work on building socialism. If you go to hear an official communist speaker, he never mentions communism. He will speak only of the struggle to complete the socialization of America. 
If you go to a communist bookstore, you'll find all of their literature pushes this theme. It does not call for the establishment of communism, but socialism. And many members of the establishment push the same theme. The September 1970 issue of New York Magazine contains an article by Harvard professor John Kenneth Galbraith, himself a professed socialist, entitled Richard Nixon and the Great Socialist Revival. Describing what he calls the Nixon Game Plan, Galbraith states, Mr. Nixon is probably not the great reader of Marx, but his advisors, Dr. Burns, Schultz, and McCracken are excellent scholars who know him well and could have brought the president abreast, and it is beyond denying that the crisis that aided the rush into socialism was engineered by the administration. Dr. Galbraith began his article by stating, Certainly the least predicted development under the Nixon administration was this great new thrust socialism. One encounters people who still aren't aware of it, others must be rubbing their eyes, for certainly the importance seemed all to the contrary. As in opposed to socialism, Mr. Nixon seemed steadfast. Galbraith then proceeds to list the giant steps towards socialism taken by the Nixon administration. The conclusion one draws from the article is that socialism, whether it be from the Democrat or Republican parties, is inevitable. Fellow Harvard socialist Dr. Arthur Schlesinger has said much of the same thing. The chief liberal gains in the past remain, generally remain on the stat statute books when the conservatives recover power. Liberalism grows constantly more liberal, and by the same token, conservatism grows constantly less conservative. Many extremely patriotic individuals who innocently fallen for the conspiracy's line, Walter Trohan, co columnist emeritus for the Chicago Tribune and one of America's outstanding political commentators, is accurately noted. It is, known f it is a known fact that the policies of the government today, whether Republican or Democratic, are closer to the 1932 platform of the Communist Party than they are to either of their own party platforms in this cr critical year. More than 100 years ago, in 1848 to be exact, Karl Marx promulgated his program for the socialized state in the Communist Manifesto. And Mr. Trohan has also been fed to believe that the trend is inevitable. Conservatives should be realistic enough to recognize that this country is going deeper into socialism and will see expansion to federal, uh, p federal power, whether Republicans or Democrats are in power. The only comfort they may have is that the peace the pace will be slower under Richard M. Nixon than it might have been under Hubert H. Humphrey. Conservatives are going to have to recognize that the Nixon administration will embrace most of the socialism of the Democratic administrations while professing to improve it. The establishment promotes the idea of the inevitability of communism through its perversion of terms using, used in describing the political spectrum. See chart 1. We are told that on the far left of the political spectrum we find communism which is admittedly dicta dictatorial, but we also are also told that equal equally to be feared is the opposite of the far left, i.e. the far right which is labeled fascism. We are constantly told that we should all try to stay in the middle of the road, which is termed democracy, but by which the establishment means Fabian or, so or creeping socialism. The fact that the middle of the road has been mo moving inexorably leftward for 40 years is ignored. Here is an excellent example of the use of false alternatives. We are given the choice between communism and international socialism on one end of the spectrum, Nazism, national socialism on the other, or Fabian socialism in the middle. The whole spectrum is socialist. This is absurd. Where would you pull an anarchist on this? Put an anarchist on the spectrum. Where do you put a person who believes in a constitutional republic and the free enterprise system? He's not represented here, yet the spectrum is used for political definitions by a, a probable 90% of the people of the nation. There is an accurate political spectrum. See chart 2. Communism is by definition total government. If you have total government, it makes little difference whether you call it communism, fascism, socialism, Caesarism, or pharaohism. It's all pretty much the same from the standpoint of the people who must live and suffer under it. If total government by any of its pseudonym stands on the far left, then by logic the far right should represent anarchy or no government. Our founding fathers revolted against the near total government of the English monarchy, but they knew that having no government at all would lead to chaos. So they set up a constitutional republic with a very limited government. They know that men prospered in freedom, 
Although the free enterprise system is not mentioned specifically in the Constitution, this is the only one which can exist under a constitutional republic. All collectivist systems require power and government which the Constitution does not grant. Our founding fathers had no intention of allowing the government to become an instrument to steal the fruit of one man's labor and give it to another who had not earned it. Our government was to be one of severely limited powers. Thomas Jefferson said, In question of the power, then let no man be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down for mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Jefferson knew that if the power, that if the government were not enslaved, people soon would be. If, the Jeff if it was Jefferson's view that government governs best, which governs least, our forefathers established this country with the very least possible amount of government. Although they lived in an age before automobiles, electric lights, and television, they understood human nature and its relation to political systems far better than do most Americans today. Times change, technology changes, but principles are eternal. Primarily, government was to provide for national defense and establish a court system. But we have burst the chains that Jefferson spoke of, and for many years now we have been moving leftward across the political spectrum toward collectivist total government. Every proposal by our political leaders, including some which are supposed to have the very opposite effect, such as Nixon's revenue-sharing proposal, carry us f further leftward to centralized government. This is not because socialism is inevitable. It is no more inevitable than pharaohism. It is largely the result of clever planning and patient gradualism. Since all communists and their insider bosses are waging a constant struggle for socialism, let us define that term. Socialism is generally denied as government ownership and or control over the basic means of production and, and distribution of goods and services. When analyzed, this means government control over everything, including you. All controls are people controls. If the government controls these areas, it can eventually do just exactly as Marx set out to do, destroy the right to private property, eliminate the family, and wipe out religion. We're being socialized in America, and everybody knows it. If we had a chance to sit down and have a cup of coffee with a man in the street that we have been interviewing, he might say, You know the one thing I can never figure out is why all these very, very wealthy people like the Kennedys, the Fords, the Rockefellers, and others are for socialism. Why are the super rich for socialism? Don't they have the, don't they have the most to lose? If, you, if I take a look at my bank account and compare it with Nelson Rockefeller's, it seems funny that I'm against socialism and he's out promoting it. Or is it funny? In reality, there's a vast difference between what the promoters define as socialism and what it is in actual practice. The idea that socialism is a share the wealth program is strictly a confidence game to get the people to surrender their freedom to an all-powerful collectivist government. While the insiders tell us we are building a paradise on earth, we are actually constructing a jail for ourselves. Doesn't it strike you as strange? that some of the individuals pushing hardest for socialism have their own personal wealth protected in family trusts and tax-free foundations. Men like Rockefeller, Ford, and Kennedy are for every socialist program known to man, which will increase your taxes, yet they pay little, if anything, in taxes themselves. An article published by the North American Newspaper Alliance in August of 1967 tells how the Rockefellers pay practically no income taxes despite their vast wealth. The article reveals that one of the Rockefellers paid the grand total of $685 personal income tax during a recent year. The Kennedys have their Chicago Merchandise Mart, their mansions, yachts, planes, etc., all owned by their myriads of family foundations and trusts. Taxes are for peons. The hypocrites like Rockefeller, Ford, and Kennedy pose a great ch as great champions of the downtrodden. They were really concerned about their, the poor. Rather than using socialism as a means of achieving personal political power, they would divest themselves of their family fortunes. There is no law which prevents them from giving away their own fortunes to the poverty is stricken. Shouldn't these men set an example and practice what they preach? If they advocate sharing the wealth, shouldn't they start with their own instead of that of the middle class which pays almost all the taxes? Why don't Nelson Rockefeller and Henry Ford II give away all their wealth retaining only enough to place paces themselves at the national average. Can't you imagine Ted Kennedy giving up his mansion, airplane, and yacht and moving into a $25,000 home with a $20,000 mortgage like the rest of us? We are usually told that this clique of super-rich are socialists because they have a guilt complex over 
wealth they inherited and did not earn. Again, they could relieve their supposed this is these supposed guilt complexes simply by divesting themselves of their unearned wealth. There are doubtless many wealthy do-gooders who have been who have given a guilt complex by their college professors, but that doesn't explain the actions of insiders like the Rockefellers, Fords, or Kennedys. All their actions betray them as power seekers. But the Kennedys, Rockefellers, and their super rich con confederates are not being hypocrites in a advocating socialism. It appears to be a co contradiction for the super rich to work for socialism and the destruction of free enterprise. In reality, it is not. Our problem is that most of us believe socialism what the socialists want us to believe. It is the share of the wealth program. That is the theory. But is that how it works? Let us examine the only socialist countries according to the socialist definition of the world extent in the world today. These are the communist countries. The communists refer the, themselves refer to these as socialist countries, as in the Union and Soviet Socialist Republics. Here, in the reality of socialism, you have a tiny oligarchical clique at the top, usually numbering no more than 3% of the total population, controlling the total wealth, total production, and the very lives of the other 97%. Certainly, even the most naive observe that Mr. Brezhnev doesn't live like one of the poor peasants out on the Russian, Great Russian Steppes. But according to socialist theory, he is supposed to do just that. One understands that socialism is not a share of the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth. Then the seeming paradox of super rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead, it becomes a logical, even the perfect tool of power-seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. The plan of the conspirator insiders, then, is to socialize the United States, not to communize it. How is this to be accomplished? Chart 3 shows the structure of our government as established by our founding fathers. The Constitution fractionalized and subdivided governmental power in every way possible. The Founding Fathers believed that each branch of the government, whether, of, whether at the federal, state, or local level, would be jealous of its powers and would never surrender them to centralized control. Also, many phases of our lives, such as charity and education, were put totally, or almost totally, out of the grasp of politicians. Under this system, you could not have a dictatorship. No segment of government could possibly amass enough power to form a dictatorship. In order to have a dictatorship, one must have a single branch holding most of the reins of power. Once you have this, a dictatorship is inevitable. The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes noted, Freedom is government divided into small fragments. Woodrow Wilson, before he became the tool of the insiders, observed, This history of liberty is a history of the limitations of government power, not the increase of it. And the English historian Lord Acton commented, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even though these men lived out our, after our constitution was written, our forefathers understood these principles completely. What is happening today? As we move leftward along the political spectrum towards socialism, all the reins of power are being centralized in the executive branch of the federal government. Much of this is being done by buying with, with legislation or with free federal grants all the other entities. Money is used as bait, and the hook is federal control. The Supreme Court has ruled, and in this qua case quite logically, that it is hardly lack of due process for the government to regulate that which it subsidizes. If you and your clique wanted control over the United States, it would be impossible to take over every city hall, every seat, and state house. You would want all power invested at the epoch of this executive branch of the federal government, then you would have only to control one man to control the whole shebang. If you wanted to control the nation's manufacturing, co co commerce, finance, transportation, and natural resources, you would need only to control the epics, the power pinnacle of an all-powerful socialist government. Then you would have a monopoly and could squeeze out all your competitors. If you wanted a national monopoly, you must control a national socialist government. If you want a worldwide monopoly, you must control a world socialist government. That is how the game is all about. That is what the game is all about. Communism is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but is a movement created, manipulated, and used by power-seeking billionaires in order to gain control over the world. 
First by establishing a socialist but socialist government in the various nations and then consolidating them all through a great merger into an all-powerful world socialist superstate, probably under the auspices of the United Nations. The balance of this book will outline just how they have used communism to approach that goal.